Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 27th of January. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information for your community and village by heading to weather.gov slash Alaska, using the weather info line at 800-472-0391, finding us on social media, whether that's Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. And of course, in the late afternoon, you can get your daily afternoon map briefing by joining us on NWS Anchorage or NWS Fairbanks on YouTube. We'll go through the surface charts that you'll see here in just a few minutes, give you a sneak peek about where the weather is going here before we get to Alaska weather time, of course. And if you miss a bit of this show, you can always go back to YouTube or uh, our a partner website at alaskapublic.org. Look on the right-hand side of your screen. You'll find this complete broadcast here a little bit later on in the evening. NOAA Weather Radio and Marine VHF, always good tools as well. Here's a look at the warning situation across South Central and Southeast. Things are pretty quiet here, so let's turn our attention a little bit further northward, and you'll see that we have blizzard warnings and uh, winter weather advisories that are still in effect for the region. Also a little bit further out toward the west and the lower Yukon Valley. Wind chill advisories are in effect there. We have uh, northeasterlies that are gusting up to about 25 miles per hour right now. And as a result of that, those feels like index is about 45 below. You'll also see uh, those advisories for the western tip of the Chukchi Peninsula, and I'm sorry, the uh, Seward Peninsula and the St. Lawrence Island region uh, for wind chill values that could be as cold as 45 below. And Mr. Sean, if you'd do me a flavor and uh, give me a little button push there and advance the show, we'll Keep on going through the rest of our weather there. Uh, once again, for the blizzard warnings across the Beaufort Seacoast, those wind chill values could be pretty cold as well, 45 to about 50 below. It uh, looks like the, uh, the visibility will continue to be poor, probably around a quarter mile or less, at least through 9 o'clock tonight and into the early morning hours there. It does look like going forward, though, we will be talking about improving conditions. The wind should gradually subside as we get into Wednesday afternoon and probably Thursday morning as high pressure is building into the north slope. And that uh, high pressure system across the north is certainly clearing out the sky. So while it is cold and breezy in some cases, uh, the winds aren't blowing in all areas like the Tanana Valley and the eastern end of uh, the interior and the upper Tanana Valley and the upper Yukon Valley. A very uh, stable area of high pressure uh, continues to be in charge there. So, South Central's weather is fairly quiet right now across southwestern Alaska. We continue to see uh, offshore flow from the north and east, so we've got some breezes blowing through that area, a little bit stronger across some of the channeled terrain. But for right now, most areas are clear. Now, coastal precipitation continues across southeastern Alaska and across south central and southwestern Alaska. Uh, most areas are seeing uh, more precipitation across the Pacific side and out across the Aleutians at this point. Low pressure continues to hover in the, in the Gulf, and for many areas there, we'll be dealing with uh, gales through the next 24 hours, there, especially tonight and into early tomorrow morning before things begin to subside across uh, the north and west. For the southern Bering Sea, we have heavy freezing spray. Uh, many areas there under a heavy freezing spray warning uh, for the central and southern Bering Sea coast there, and storm warnings are in effect for the central and western chain. So. Uh, we continue to see some strong and gusty winds there as several waves of low pressure are working their way uh, through the southern Bering Sea coast. Once again, there's a look at your wind chill advisories across the lower Yukon Valley and the western tip of the Seward Peninsula. Looking at your satellite picture right now, you'll notice that offshore flow continues across the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta. You've got a strong northerly flow working its way down across the central and western chain. And when you see this type of uh, kind of speckled pattern, it looks like a kind of a mackerel or a fish side of the fish, the scales here, that's a really good sign. There's a lot of cold air dropping into uh, areas further south. So a pretty stout northerly flow working on the backside of low pressure and high pressure helping that along, working that conveyor belt south and west. To the west of that, though, a very healthy southerly flow working up and through eastern Siberia. 
All that, though, is being put on pause thanks to low pressure across the western Gulf. Again, a lot of precipitations focusing on the Pacific side. Kodiak Island will be looking at rain and snow in the next 24 hours. A little bit of a break in the clouds from time to time across southeast today. There were some pockets of rainfall there, but you can also see how the cold air is still kind of hovering right here across northern and southeast and certainly into the Copper River Basin where we expect snow showers again over the next several days. High pressure sitting across the Yukon, also across the North Slope, also across the eastern uh, sections of Siberia. All that trying to push cold further and further southward, and that's again put on pause by low pressure across the western Gulf, pushing an occlusion further and further north. That is going to have a hard time working a whole lot further north, though, because of that very cold and dense air, 1,033 millibars for the Arctic coast. We still see some strong winds from the north and west working their way around the eastern Beaufort Sea Coast. Now, once again, that should start to subside as we get into Friday. High pressure kind of easing that pressure gradient a little bit further eastward into the uh, coastal areas of Canada. You'll notice that occlusion working its way northward across the southern Gulf Coast and warmer air starting to push northward even more. It looks like Juno is going to be right there on the edge, probably dealing with a chance of rain and snow as we get into Wednesday, maybe becoming more snow as we go through Wednesday afternoon. Rain and snow for areas around Kodiak and uh, most of the chain really having an opportunity at least for rain and snow showers. Most areas probably not seeing any sizable amounts of accumulation. Could be a couple inches of slush there in Kodiak. As we get into Thursday, high pressure still in charge of the no north slope. You'll see it's building, though, 1,041 millibars. Watch for areas of fog there, certainly some ice fog across the interior. Otherwise, a mainly clear sky once you get above that low deck. Uh, watch for uh, some snow showers across the Copper River Basin. The Cook Inlet dealing with a mostly to partly cloudy sky from time to time on Thursday. Southeast, periods of rainfall near the coast. A better chance for mixed precipitation higher up and into uh, western sections of British Columbia. Look for periods of rain and snow showers for the Alaska Peninsula and the central chain with high pressure working its way southward. So everything we see out to the west probably going to stay to the west for a while. And that also means another round of colder air. It's going to have to build up even more to work its way up and over the cold air we already have across a good chunk of western and central and northern sections of Alaska. Here's a look at temps today for southeast. We saw readings back in the mid to upper 30s. A few places like Ketchikan and Annette were nosing up on 40 degrees. Uh, the south and western parts of the Yukon Territory in the uh, 25 to as cold as 36 below range there earlier today. South central looking at readings in the teens and 20s. Prince William Sound got as cold as 7 there around Valdez earlier today. Swetna, Talkeetna also uh, closer to zero. Fairbanks, uh, looks like Tanana, anywhere from 25 to 35 below. Places like Chicken got down to 51 below today, I believe, uh, maybe even colder in some places surrounding the region. Uh, 36 below for Arctic Village, a colder start for sure this morning, anywhere from 10 to 30 below for the Arctic Coast. Atkasuk at 29 below, about the same for Kivalina around 4 o'clock. Nome was 4 above, 0 for Unalakleet, Grayling 9 below, McGrath 18 below. And for south and west, including Bristol Bay, we saw readings in the teens, 20s, and low 30s. The Alaska Peninsula in the 30s and 40s, with St. Paul and St. George in the mid to upper 20s. Adak, Atka, and Shemya all just a hair above freezing. For the interior tonight, look for more temperatures closing in on 45 to 50 below. It's going to be a cold night in Fort Yukon, as it should be this time of the year. 20s and 30s for southeast, a few areas holding on to temps closer to 40. South central single digits for you, 38 degrees in Kodiak and the mid to upper 30s for the chain and for the Alaska Peninsula. A few places like Sand Point and Falls Pass closer to 40. Nome down to 19 below and for Barrow, 22 below. High temperatures tomorrow from 15 to 20 below across the Arctic coast. The Kotzebue Sound 5 to 10 below, Nome 4 above, Fairbanks looking at 28 below, Fort Yukon up to 35 below, South Central in the teens and 20s, Kodiak 34, Southeast in the upper 30s to mid 40s, warmer air again working northward, the Alaska Peninsula and the chain still in the upper 30s to about 40 degrees at best on the south side of the peninsula. IFR conditions are expected along that frontal boundary as it's working northward and southeast. Otherwise, a wide area of MVFR, a lot of that will hang just south of Prince William Sound, cover up Kodiak Island. And on the north side, IFR conditions there with MVFR for the Arctic coast. Here's your pass conditions now. We do expect fog in parts of the interior, but the passes themselves expect VFR there for Adigan and Attic Tuvik Pass. Uh, we also expect to see VFR conditions for Lake Clark and Merrill Pass throughout your Wednesday. Rainy Pass is looking good. Windy Pass should be just fine. Isabel Pass, visual flight rule will continue throughout your Wednesday. Same goes for Mentasta Pass. Tanita Pass right now looking pretty good for visibility. Portage Pass we will call MVFR, but that should improve slowly throughout the day. Maybe a few snow showers in the region, and we expect more snow to develop around Chilkoot and White Pass during the day. 
Here's your freezing levels now, as you would expect with this intense cold across the Gulf Coast. The surface freezing lines right over south central and southeastern Alaska, just north of Sitka, it looks like by tomorrow morning. Across the eastern Gulf Coast, the freezing levels rise to two, even 4,000 feet. They're just south and west of Haida Gwaii. And the surface freezing line in the Bering is just south of St. George Island and all the way uh, to Attu Island and just north of that location. Icing potential has areas in the occasional, the widespread moderate across central and southern parts of southeast. Again, that's going to be above about 6,000 feet. Those levels drop a little bit more out around Kodiak Island and to the west into the Alaska Peninsula. Light to isolated moderate icing potential is possible there. And generally across the central Aleutians above 3,000 feet elsewhere. Icing should not be a significant risk. Though again, there will be some poor visibility and perhaps some ice ups possible across the eastern Beaufort Seacoast through tomorrow morning. Looking aloft now at the jet stream level, you can see a north and westerly flow cutting into the northern parts of Yukon, a steady flow there around 50 knots, and south and westerly winds coming into southeastern Alaska around 80 to 90 knots, rounding high pressure there across the Pacific Northwest. High pressure still in charge of most of Alaska, but to our west, another area of high pressure is curving in. Some stronger northerly winds cutting through the Bering Sea, those winds up to 75 even 100 knots. At 9,000 feet, ridge of high pressure is clearly in charge of the interior right now. You can see low pressure across the Chukchi Sea. Those winds coming in from the south and west along the Chukchi Sea coast in Kotzebue Sound around 45 knots. High pressure finishes the pattern here with a northeasterly flow moving offshore of the west coast. Those winds as high as 40 to 50 knots by the time they reach the central chain and southerlies working through the eastern gulf at 30 to 40 knots there with high pressure still sitting over Haida Gwaii. A similar pattern here at 3,000 feet. Southerly is working into the Gulf around 20 to 35 knots or so. We still have that offshore flow moving up from the north and east. Coming over the Seward Peninsula at 20 knots, reaching Atka around 50 knots or so and 40 knots as it moves over Dutch Harbor and Alaska. Uh, more of a broad easterly flow working across the northern Gulf at 25 to 30 knots. And there's our strong west and northwesterly flow that we're finding at the surface as well. Those wind speeds around 35 to 40 knots at 3,000 feet for the eastern Beaufort Sea coast. So when you put that all together, places to watch for turbulence tomorrow, we're still going to keep an eye out for the central and maybe the eastern Beaufort Sea coast there below 3,000 feet. And poor visibility will probably be more of a problem than turbulence. For southeast, below 6,000 feet, watch for some occasional moderate there as that triple point and part of that warmer area air is lifting northward quickly. That may stir things up here a little bit more, again, especially below 6,000 feet and especially in some of the channel terrain. Below 4,000 feet across the northern Gulf, that includes areas around Kodiak Island, the Alaska Peninsula, and generally south from Sand Point westward all the way out toward Falls Pass, maybe even Dutch Harbor on Alaska. And then for the central chain, watch for some additional occasional moderate there below 4,000 feet. That's a look at your aviation forecast and your surface weather. In just a few minutes, Mike Ottenweiler will join us with a look at the marine forecast. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, and today I'm privileged to introduce Dr. Uccellini, the director of the United States National Weather Service. Welcome back to Alaska, sir. Thank you, Dave. Glad to be here. Thanks. Uh, prior to be being the leader of the National Weather Service, uh, your work included an extensive look at snowstorms across the northeastern United States. These are the types of storms that can bring some of the country's largest cities to its knees. Uh, tell me a little bit about your fascination with snow. Well, as far back as I can remember, I've, I've always been interested in, in weather, mm -hmm. uh, growing up as a, as a kid in, uh, on Long Island, New York, and was particularly fascinated by uh, snowstorms. Um, why they occurred. The distribution of snow was very varied across the entire region. The rain snow line, all those things fascinated me right from the get-go. And um, I was interested in knowing how they worked, um, how the forecast worked, or more often than not, didn't work uh, uh, one way or the other. And that drove me, um, uh, that interest continued to build and um, drove me through high school right into college, uh, wanting to be a meteorologist. Okay, that's a fascinating story, and I think every meteorologist has a weather story like that in some way. Right. Uh, due to Alaska's size and the proximity to the North Pole, sometimes it's difficult to detect and analyze the weather patterns over Alaska. Uh, what's the National Weather Service doing to improve that weather detection? Well, uh, observations uh, in this type of an environment is, is a big challenge, uh, whether it's um, from space um, or uh, from what we call in situ observations from the from the ground or within the systems. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, uh, satellites have been playing an increasing role in providing uh, the big picture, uh, not only from a visual sense and what you see is occurring, um, but also from providing the data for numerical models that 
than are used to actually predict the weather. Uh, Alaska is actually pretty well uh, positioned with respect to polar orbiting satellites since mm -hmm. you get a, um, a, a, a faster return of those satellites over your particular area. And in fact, the, uh, the polar satellite system is the backbone for the observations that we use in our models, uh, especially our global models, and they're particularly important uh, for observing weather features that affect Alaska. Alaskans live and die by the weather every day. And one of the strategic goals of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the National Weather Service is to develop a more weather-ready nation. What does it mean for Alaskans to be weather-ready? Well, the, the strategic outcome is based on uh, people being ready, responsive, and therefore resilient to uh, the increasing uh, threats to extreme weather events. Uh, those threats are related to um, not only the nature of the events, but the fact that we're becoming more vulnerable to them as we have more people, more infrastructure uh, that could be um, affected by these events. So we have to ensure that the observations we make for situational awareness, the forecasts we make for people to take the proper responses um, are connected uh, to people's uh, actions, uh, the response to these events so that uh, they will be more resilient uh, to um, uh, what's uh, facing them. Um, you know, there are examples with respect to hurricanes, uh, more people living along the coastline takes longer to evacuate. We have to make better forecasts with longer lead times, but we also have to communicate the threat so people will actually take action to avoid those storms. Up here you have, um, as in other parts of the United States, an increasing threat related to fire. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, as there are more people living in fire-prone areas, um, we have to ensure that our forecasts are good, uh, that we don't have uh, false alarms that make people not react to uh, uh, the forecast when, in fact, they should. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have to be able to communicate the threat and make sure that we're working with the partners in the emergency management community uh, so that um, communities uh, and right down to individuals will actually take the proper responses in the face of these events. So that's the strategic goal. There are a lot of challenges for us in terms of improving forecasts, but also improving our communication skills and linking with the emergency management communities that are actually out there uh, trying to protect lives and mitigate property loss. So a huge partnership effort going forward. Uh, that's, that's one of the important keys for the success of uh, meeting the strategic goal. Okay. One of the things you're talking about was uh, understanding the, the weather information we're getting back from the computers, weather modeling, and you did a lot of work with that in some of your prior, uh, prior positions with the Environmental Prediction Center there, the National Center for Environmental Prediction. Um, what can you tell us about recent improvements in that weather modeling, and you're using uh, the polar orbiters as kind of a, a source of information that started right. that process? Well, you know, first of all, we have to recognize that everything you see you read and hear about weather, climate, or ocean forecasts are all driven by numerical models. Now, mm -hmm. it, it really has been the, uh, the revolution in our forecast process uh, in the last part of, um, of the 20th century. Uh, the success of that numerical enterprise is based on three factors. Big computers, mm -hmm. um, uh, global data, not just local data, but you have to have a global data set and then the models themselves, the science that's behind the models and in running the models um, in an operational mode. So we're working to improve all three of those components. Uh, we um, upgraded our computers last year. We're, we're going through another upgrade even as I speak. Uh, we'll be upgrading from 200 trillion calculations per second to 700 trillion mm -hmm. calculations per second by January of 2015. Uh, this increase in the computer will allow us to run what we call Earth system models. It's not just the atmosphere, it's the atmosphere, ocean, mm -hmm. ice, mm -hmm. which is obviously very important up here, and land models that are all coupled together okay. at higher resolution. So you need the big computers, you need the uh, science uh, that allows us to run these models and run them in a parallel mode and that they're coupled so that the ocean effects could affect the atmosphere and vice versa, mm -hmm. as an example. Uh, and then the global observations are absolutely critical and um, over the last 20, 30 years they've become more dependent upon the satellite systems um, and especially the uh, polar orbiting satellites which help drive 
the, uh, the observations needed for those models, whether they be atmospheric observations, land, ice observations. Um, we're driving more and more of that from satellites now that feed into these models and produce forecasts with extended lead times. Now out, you know, for extreme events especially, we're, we're seeing a much improved forecast out in the four, five, six, seven, and even eight day range, which is, gets us back to Weather Ready Nation because if you're gonna get ready for a storm event, you want those consistent forecasts approaching that event from day seven, six, five, four, three, mm -hmm. so you can take the actions several days in advance that can help mitigate the property loss and, and, and protect uh, your livelihood. Okay, all part of the mission of protecting life and property. Dr. Uccellini, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And speaking to Alaskans and sharing how the National Weather Service is working for Alaska and the nation. Wish you safe travels around the 49th. Enjoy your time here, sir. And for Alaska Weather Facts, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. And welcome back from the segment. I'm meteorologist Mike Ottenweller, taking you through your marine forecast this evening. Looking off into southeast Alaska, you can see here towards Stevens Passage and Clarence Strait, winds coming out of the southeast, 35 knots, and switching to a northerly direction at 25 knots. Up towards Lynn Canal, we're looking for winds northerly at about 30 knots. Seas on the order of 6 to 7 feet there in the inner passageways. Some higher gusts uh, towards Clarence Strait out of the uh, northeast at about 30 knots. As we get towards the gulf there, we're seeing seas running on the order of 12 to 13 feet and winds generally out of the southeast, 30 to 35 knots. Until you get up towards Yakutat, we're looking for a more easterly flow up there out of the east, 35 knots and 12-foot seas. Stepping into Thursday, still seeing things south-southeast for the southern portion of the inner waterways at about 20 to 25 knots. And again, staying out of the north for Lynn Canal, 30 knots, seas on the order of 4 to 6 feet. As we get towards the Gulf Coast, we're looking for 20 to 25 knots, switching to a southwesterly direction on Thursday unless you're up towards the eastern gulf and then we keep things out of the east 15 knots and seas running on the order of about 9 to 11 feet. Working towards south central for the northern Cook Inlet seas excuse me winds are going to be out of the north at about 15 knots and seas running at about 4 feet. We do expect some freezing spray to be a problem through the Cook Inlet on Wednesday. Over towards Prince William Sound seas are going to be on the order of about 3 feet out of the northeast 15 knots and some higher gusts to about 30 uh, 30 knots out of bays and passes in that area. As we get towards the Gulf of Alaska, looking for east to northeast flow down towards Kodiak Island, 30 to 35 knots in that area and 12 to 14 foot seas. And then towards the western Barren Islands and down towards Shelikov Strait, increasing winds 30 to 40 knots as you move towards the southwest and seas will be building with those increasing winds uh, from 10 up to 18 feet down towards Shelikov Strait. Then on Thursday, we keep that northeasterly flow for Cook Inlet, increase it to 20 knots and seas building to about 5 feet. For Prince William Sound, northeast flow 15 knots and seas again about 3 feet with those higher gusts continuing out of bays and passes with cold air bottled up over the interior portion of the state. Then in the Gulf, we expect 15 to 20 knots out of the southeast becoming northeasterly and then back again to the southeast towards Kodiak Island. Seas on the order of about 7 to 9 feet and seas towards uh, the Shelikov area, 11 to 12 feet, with winds again northeast, 30 to 35 knots, a little bit calmer than Wednesday. For the Alaska Peninsula, looking for northeast flow to dominate the entire area, winds will be 30 to 40 knots, and seas uh, 6 feet coming out of Bristol Bay, becoming 14 feet as you get further towards Cold Bay. South of the chain, we expect about 30 to 35 knots out of the northeast and 13 foot seas. Freezing spray will be an issue right along the ice edge. On into Thursday, we keep that freezing spray in the forecast with winds northeast 30 to 35 knots. Seas building from Bristol Bay out towards Cold Bay 6 feet to 13 feet. And south of the chain 20 to 35 knots from the, south, for, excuse me, from the northeast and 8 to 11 foot seas. Looking out towards our Aleutian Islands, expect a little bit stronger winds in this area here with that tighter pressure gradient coming around the high over the western bearing. Northeasterly becoming northerly flow 45 to 50 knots and seas jumping all the way up to 24 feet as you get towards Adak and Atka. A little bit farther to the west near Shimia, expect 30 knots out of the northeast and seas generally on the order of about 13 feet. On into Thursday, 
A little bit less, uh, a little bit less brisk, brisk conditions for this area. 40 knots out of the northeast for most of the eastern and central Aleutians. Sea subsiding some, six, 16 to 19 feet in this area. And then northeast becoming southeast for the western Aleutians at 30 knots. Sea is generally 14 feet. As we get towards the west coast of the state, we expect from St. Lawrence Island all the way down towards the Pribilofs, northerly flow will dominate this area. Expect winds 25, building all the way to 40 knots as you get towards the Pribilof Islands. And again, as you move away from the ice edge, seas will build from 8 all the way up to 15 feet near the Pribilofs, and freezing spray will once again be a factor along the ice edge. Conditions don't change a whole lot in this area for Thursday. Expect northerly flow to continue. 15 knots towards St. Lawrence Island, all the way up to 35 knots by the Pribilof Islands, and seas generally on the order from 4 to 7 feet along the ice edge towards 14 feet up near the Pribilofs. For the, west excuse me, for the Arctic coast on Wednesday, we expect northerly flow along the northwest point, just north of Seward Peninsula, 5 to 15 knots there, becoming westerly for the Arctic coast, 10 to 25 knots over towards Kaktovik. And on Thursday, expect a little bit more variable conditions along the northwest portion of the state, 10 to 15 knots, becoming southerly and then westerly, 10 to 15 knots along the Arctic coast. So recapping tonight's weather, as Dave mentioned, we do have this frontal boundary that's laid up right here along the Gulf Coast, and with that, precipitation will continue for much of the Gulf Coast regions from Kodiak over towards the eastern Aleutians. Expect a rain-snow mix, and towards the southeast Alaska, this, frontal, this triple point boundary here will bring rain to the, uh, to the coastal areas, and a little bit farther onshore, we'll see a rain-snow mix with snow into the higher elevations. Cold air continues to dominate with clear skies over most of the state, and our blowing snow and blizzard conditions will continue to affect the Arctic coast through the evening hours. Looking into Wednesday, our frontal boundary has not moved much and precipitation will continue for the coastal regions. And on into Thursday, high pressure slides north, clear and cold for the mainland, and precipitation more for the coastal regions. Thanks for watching and have a great evening. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.